the darkest of times, brave men and women stood up. When oppressed, they rose. Together, they fought for greater justice, respect, and compassion. They had a dream for a better future. Today, we are at a turning point. Stakes are high. Climate change, inequality, hate speech. We may feel overwhelmed, but there is hope. You, we, together, can create the change we want. By speaking out, by standing up, by taking action. Be the leader you are looking for. Stand up for human rights. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the director of the USC Institute on Inequalities in Global Health, Professor Sophia Gruskin. Good morning, everyone. Before starting with our formal program, allow me to extend a heartfelt welcome on behalf of all of the partners who came together to put together this event to all of you, students, staff, faculty, deans, and senior leadership from USC, Congresswoman Linda Sanchez, community members, organizers, advocates, and activists, and consular representatives from the following countries, Australia, Belize, Bolivia, Bulgaria, Ecuador, Egypt, Finland, France, Greece, Indonesia, Iraq, Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, Myanmar, Philippines, Qatar, Republic of Azerbaijan, Romania, Senegal, South Africa, Spain, Thailand, United Arab Emirates, and United Kingdom. Wow, welcome everyone. If you'll allow me, perhaps it's easiest to start with a simple question, why do this event at all? And there is a simple answer. It feels so important now in 2018, with all the horrible things happening everywhere in the world, for those of us who believe in human rights, health and well-being, and the power of what rights can offer us all, everyone in the world and without distinction, to celebrate what human rights can offer to do the hard work together to address the challenges in implementing a rights agenda head on, and ultimately to reflect on where human rights have the power, the too often underappreciated power, and legitimacy to take us, whatever differences we might have. And just to be clear from a human rights perspective, if you look across the globe, we've accomplished a lot in these last 70 years in terms of civil and political rights, in terms of working conditions, access to education, to health care, in so many areas where there are unexpected successes that need to be celebrated. And if only for ceremonial reasons, today, December 10th, is the key day the anniversary of when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted in 1948. 70 years ago to this day, it's hard to believe. And in this time, the UDHR has come to lay the foundation for the human rights protections that exist in most all countries of the world today. So it's a good time to take stock of our achievements since 1948, but perhaps more importantly, to think about the future. And I think we are likely all in agreement Times are now more difficult than ever, here in Los Angeles, but truly everywhere. And the question of whether human rights can be part of the resistance to rising populism, nationalism, and even fascism is unfortunately on the table. And so we need to think now, this December 10th, how do we, universities, communities, government officials, media, and all of us who care about rights and justice get past our differences and work together to set a rights-oriented agenda going forward. The foundations are there, but now we need to see what it really means and what we really need to do now to address injustice, inequality, and discrimination for all people here in Los Angeles, in Paris, where the Universal Declaration was adopted 70 years ago, and in all parts of the world. 
even in these complicated times, and not just for now, for the present, but for the next 70 years. And so a big part of taking us forward and pushing back against current efforts to marginalize human rights, and for what, lack of a better term, I'm going to call global solidarity, is what we're doing here today to hear and to engage with university, United Nations, government, and civil society perspectives on why and how human rights matter for sustainable development and for health and well-being here in Los Angeles and around the world. And so to get the ball rolling, please allow me to introduce our first speaker. It is my great pleasure to introduce Wanda Austin, the interim president of the University of Southern California. Now, amongst her many acolytes that I could cite, I'll say only that she is internationally recognized for her work in aeronautics and systems engineering with a PhD from USC. And she served on the President Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. She's a member of the Defense Policy Board, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of Engineering. And speaking now as a faculty, I cannot emphasize enough how wonderful it is to have her in this position. Her stated commitment to ensuring that students are well-rounded, well-informed global citizens is exactly what this event is about, and I think it is why she agreed to speak with us here today. Please join me in welcoming USC President Austin to the stage. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Grushkin, for that generous, generous introduction. And thanks to all of you here on the USC campus, and for those of you who are watching via live stream. Welcome to the University of Southern California. I also want to welcome all of our guest speakers, including Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti, and UN Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights, Kate Gilmore. This is a momentous occasion for our university and for our city. Today marks the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and I am so proud USC is taking a leadership role in this celebration. The declaration was adopted by the UN General Assembly in response to the human rights horrors of World War II. Decades later, the UN went a step further by linking human rights to sustainable development. One cannot truly thrive without the other. And together, they empower us in confronting the complex global challenges that we face. The UN's goal for sustainable development serve as a guide to tackling those challenges, poverty, climate change, homelessness, and inequality. At USC, we see ourselves as having a special responsibility in finding solutions to these seemingly impossible problems. The UN's goals for sustainable development serve as a guide to tackling those challenges. We do this through education, we do this through groundbreaking research, and perhaps most importantly, we do this through community engagement. Indeed, USC has long been a place where people can come together in unfettered dialogue. By fostering difficult conversations about difficult issues, we foster solutions. Although we are a private university, we have always had a public mission. Since our finding in 1880, USC has been committed to advancing society and elevating humanity. Toward that effort, we've developed a series of initiatives to help USC take the lead in key areas from homelessness to Alzheimer's disease. As just one example, USC's chapter of Engineers Without Borders saw two of our students put sustainability into real action. The pair created a rainwater collection system and took it to Guatemala where 70% of families deal with malnutrition, which is a major global health issue. Closer to home, and as a second example, students from across our university 
worked with Mayor Garcetti's office to help LA's homeless. Their practicum focused on how human rights and the UN sustainability goals might offer new solutions. As one student, Valentino Messino put it, as a filmmaker and storyteller, I don't want and cannot close my eyes and live blindly, especially when the world and humanity needs to face one of its most serious global crises ever. Valentino's words are spot on. They capture the spirit of so many of the scholars at USC. We think globally and we are compassionate. On this 70th anniversary, may we face the challenges before us by bringing hope to the marginalized and safety to the suffering because every human being deserves to live in dignity and without fear. That is what USC is working toward. And I want to thank you for being part of this work and always, always fight on. Adopted in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights establishes the equal dignity and worth of every person. Its principles are as relevant now as they were then. We have the right to speak up, to participate in decision making, to an education and a decent life. Our shared humanity is rooted in these values. Societies which uphold human rights are fairer, more prosperous, and more peaceful. Over the past 70 years, the Declaration has helped countless people gain greater freedom and equality. The dignity of millions has been uplifted, and untold human suffering prevented. But its promise is yet to be fully realized. Today, many of us are fearful about the way the world is heading. Human values are under attack. Inequality, poverty, racism, conflicts, climate change. We must draw a line and stand up for our rights and those of others. Wherever we are, at school, at work, or on social media, we can all make a difference. Every day, everywhere, stand up for human rights and our shared humanity. I hope you feel inspired by the video, and I, I wanted to take a minute also to thank President Austin for her inspiring remarks and for getting us off on the right foot. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Kate Gilmore, the United Nations Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights. Now, there are many things that one can say about Kate Gilmore and her amazing work over the years. She is a true human rights hero with incredible experience in strategic leadership and in human rights advocacy and in all corners of the globe and with every kind of actor, with the United Nations, with governments, with civil society. I've had the experience of seeing her in action and I mean it when I say that her work and her approach to her work are not only powerful, but inspirational. We're really incredibly lucky to have her here with us. Please, will you join me in welcoming Deputy High Commissioner Kate Gilmore to the stage. Thank you very much indeed. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends, troublemakers. <laughs> a very, very happy Human Rights Day to you all. 
for us, uh, there is no better place to be than right here, right now, with you to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And on behalf of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, whose warmest greetings I bring, we are extremely honoured to stand here alongside President Wanda Austin and the University of Southern California and with Mayor Eric Garcetti in the city of Los Angeles to affirm this global celebration. And our warmest, warmest thanks indeed to you all for setting aside your precious time to make this a true celebration. Let me underscore that we stand here uh, owing so much to the work of the renowned champion of human rights, Professor Sophia Grushkin. Her work at the intersections of health and human rights has shaped not only that of the United Nations, but of many countries all around the world. Uh, Sophia, we, we're just so grateful for your friendship, your example, your courage, and your commitment. So it's a time of thanks and of gratitude and of deep appreciation. Don't underestimate for even a moment what a seriously serious major turnaround, straight up and down, earth rocking, game changing, heart moving, mind shaking, body shielding, action taking, tradition breaking, law making energy was released when passed by acclamation was, in 1948, that declaration. You know, uh, the Guinness Book of Records, uh, one of my go own go-to authoritative <laughs> sources, confirms that no other text has ever been translated into so many languages. No other set of values has ever traveled so far, so fast, to reach so many, so quickly. The 28 substantive articles, the operational invocations of the other two, and the poetry of its preamble setting out our workable, realistic framework by which human dignity may be upheld. An operating manual, if you like, for a humanizing relationship between power and relative powerlessness, a platform in compliance with which policy, law, regulation can uphold our equality in midst of our differences, can protect our freedom within the richness of our diversity, appreciates our individuality within a framework of common interest. From that declaration, 70 years on, there flows now tried and tested, a rich body of norms, legally binding treaties that affirms by, track, by tackling racism, opposing sexism, limiting the coercive power of the state, committing to just justice, freeing freedoms of speech, assembly and belief that has contributed to the protection and elevation of dignity for millions, offering strength to those demanding liberation from the colonizer, advocating dignity for people with disability, protecting the child in the family, affirming the rights of women in marriage, defending workers in the workplace, rights for prisoners even when imprisoned. Friends, human rights you know, they, they don't prevent our diversity, they protect it. They don't limit what we can say or believe or the opinions we hold. They ensure it. They don't restrict our enjoyment and expression of culture. They guarantee it. And what's perhaps most important of all for, I don't need the UDHR to tell me I have rights, I need it to tell that you have rights. Perhaps most importantly, the Declaration invites us to hold our rights in such a way that each of us has rights upheld. I cannot hold my rights at cost to yours. 
the right to life and liberty and security of person that we may all live and love without fear. The right to education, to health, to shelter, decent work, that we may have to hand dignity's essentials. Our right to be at home. Freedom from discrimination, from arbitrary arrest, from torture. That we might have the confidence too that those who will govern us will govern fairly. The right to a fair trial, which underpins all freedoms. The right to speak out, to stand up, so that we may not, by malevolence, be rendered silent. And the opposites of human rights upheld? Selfishness, bullying, bigotry, injustice, repression, toxic stepping stones, perverse paving of pathways to privation, to suffering, to conflict, and ultimately atrocity. Friends, that a promise is poorly kept brings no shame to the promise. So let us at least cast aside the falsehoods that have somehow attached themselves to the modern compendium of rights. Rights are not a privilege project. They were forged not in prosperity or privilege, but drafted amidst, rather, the rubble, rack and ruin of reckless rancour. Under shadow of the gravest violent extremism committed in living human memory. Adoption in 1948 of the Declaration was not an impost of the West upon the rest. In fact, the delegates of the West were amongst the most reluctant. It was states newly decolonized that gave much of the content to the Declaration. Latin America pushed for social and economic rights. The Soviet Union advocated for protection against race-based discrimination. Pakistan and India pressed hard for recognition of the equal pay, equal distribution of property, equal application of marriage laws. It was an India delegate who persuaded the negotiators, who met 81 times over 168 resolutions, that the Declaration's first article should not read, all men are born free and equal, but rather that all human beings are born free and equal with dignity and human rights. This modern compendium of rights was also not modernity's offspring alone. On the Cyrus scroll housed in the British Museum, there resides still concrete evidence of the commitment by the 6th century BC, King of Mesopotamia, his commitment to his people's freedom of thought, freedom of belief and freedom of movement. Centuries before the Magna Carta sought to bend the English key's knee to the rights of the people. Centuries before Magna Carta's contemporary, the African Mandan Charter promised equality for women. Three centuries on, William Shakespeare would have his Thomas More denounce London's xenophobic riots as mountainous inhumanity. Mountainous inhumanity. The 19th century anti-slavery struggle, the 20th century anti-colonial struggle, the 21st century hashtag Me Too movement, down through time, across culture, faith and tradition, in all our diversity and difference and our distinction, it's simply universally the case that we hunger for food we thirst for water, but we long too for justice. In this, there's neither north nor south, there's not east or west, there's no right or left, 
is only the humane and the inhumane. Friends, the symbolism of celebrating the Universal Declaration of Human Rights under shelter of a university is weighty, substantial. You know, it was around this time of year, but a millennium ago, that having barricaded themselves in Paris's Latin Quarter to resist violent attack directed against them, student and teacher formed first time a unique union, or in Latin of their day, a universitas. The better to defend their rights to assemble, to teach and to learn. History doesn't record the color of their jackets. Gilets jaunes, gilets rouges, gilets bleus, it's not clear. <coughs> what is clear is that the newly formed Universitas of Masters and Students of Paris immediately petitioned the king for protection against assault, demanding from him greater respect for their rights. Now, <coughs> the king was a bit taken aback <laughs> by this audacious insistence. So he made first to refuse them, to deny their rights of association. And so famously they gave him this response, then we shall shake the dust of the streets of Paris from the hems of our gowns. Their departure as a universitas from the city was a price the king knew a city could ill afford. And so the members of the universitas, the unis university, emerged in shelter not under shadow, but in shelter, more protected as rightsful residents of the city, acknowledged thus as central to the city and its underlying polity. As across the world, those denouncing recent attack on academic freedom emphasize the universitas is a linchpin, not only of independent and objective research, the cradle of fact, but it is a linchpin of a functioning democracy. A functioning democracy. And a linchpin of the city. Friends, you know, a city is not a city if not for its people. There is no city without people, no people without rights, sine qua non. A city inevitably is simply first and foremost and last thing at night, inevitably, enduringly habitat for rights holders. Urban development, a matter of how best to create and sustain infrastructure for that humanizing habitat. And local authority, a matter of how best to meet obligations to that common humanity. The common humanity of entitlement for each and every city dweller being born free and equal in dignity and rights. We must bring rights home. To bring rights home, spatial and urban planning, the design and allocation of housing, precinct and public amenity are never merely technical issues. They're never just investment or financial questions. As urban planners, architects, developers, local government officials decisively, decisively shape the look and feel and fabric of a city, they do so for better or for worse in the business of rights. To a city of peace, equality and inclusion, rights are assets. Tested by courts the world over, looked to in hope by those who otherwise language, languish without hope, rights are not nominal ideas for compliance at authorities convenient. No, they're enduring details of our elemental condition as human beings, of our humanized con condition. And violated, we all are dehumanized. Cities must and can bring rights home for each of us to the exclusion, exclusion of none of us in the interests of all of us. And this matters now, today, more than ever before.
For the first time in human history, more people are living in the city than in rural areas. Unless and until human rights in the city are upheld, respected and protected, cities, given their scale and their reach, have a tremendous and terrifying capacity to dehumanise. It's there, in new developments and old abandonments, that financial crises exact their most tragic impost. It's here that violence is at its most menial and its most intimate. It's there that inequality finds its most material and unlamented expression, and it's in the city, decimating already sprawling slums, scouring even gated communities, that climate instability will exact highest cost. And yet, despite this unmediated proximity to the lived realities of our daily dignity, our rights quotidienne, many of the world's urban spaces, great and small, are reproducing, not dismantling, inequalities. And further, the barriers that so many urban dwellers confront when raising their voices for exercise of their choices are not mere accidents of fate. More often, those impediments in law, policy and practice are based in deliberate decisions by decision makers to betray rights. After all, women and girls are not left out of equal access to inheritance of land and ownership of resources by their chromosomes. The brutal stereotyping, discrimination and exclusion, the disproportionate houselessness that threatens even the right to life of people of African descent worldwide is not an unfortunate side effect of a particular skin pigment. The grinding, blinding, sidelining xenophobia that in cities the world over is greeting asylum seekers, refugees and migrants, even though mass movement of people within and across borders is the very basis of globalised and localised economy, that is not some inevitable byproduct of too much difference in language, religion, or what, national costume. Gender based violence, at long last under brighter spotlight, thanks to civic action, peeling back the veils of shame, stigma, and fear, is not the product of genitalia. Ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities largely locked out of our democratic institutions, but so readily locked up in our prisons, indigenous people underrepresented amongst the privileged and overrepresented amongst the poorest of the poor, transgender people denied our acceptance and exposed most to our violence. All of that is a product of decision making, of our decisions. When even unaccompanied children are denied access to the most basic social services, when children are rendered unaccompanied, <laughs> forcibly removed from their families on the move, you know. Decision makers are acting deliberately, with intent, are complicit. A city that is segregated spatially, whose practices and precincts and infrastructure creates privilege for some while denying the bases of humanity to others is a city divided decisively. A divided city is a city deciding for injustice, criminalization and against inclusion, against diversity, against personal intimate security, against lived in peace. A city that tolerates toxic intolerance, built on disregard, on false fear, on contempt for the other. A city with integrated economy, but no human ecology. A city that excludes, locks out, locks up. That's less a city and more a detention facility. It's not a home for all, but in so many places, a hell hole for many. It was the incomparable Nelson Mandela, the centenary of whose birth we also celebrate this year, who pointed out no one is born ready to hate. It's all learned. It can all be unlearned. If we can decide to engender discrimination and disrespect, 
if we can decide to foster hate and exclusion, if we can decide to tolerate intolerable inequality, we can decide not to do so. And so we should, and so we must. It's clear, cities that are fairer, more inclusive, and more humanizing work. Inclusive, diverse, just cities flourish human talent and human capability. Cities where pluralistic expression of culture and opinion is embraced as innovative and creative, where embrace of people in distress is upheld as compassion, as justice, where homes that dignify are understood not to be the privilege of the privileged, but to be a driving force for sustainable peace and prosperity for all. Those are cities that work and we have the evidence that this is true. If we are to drive our cities to greater inclusivity, the active participation of people in those cities is just essential. As renowned Canadian urban planning philosopher Jane Jacobs said, cities have the capability of providing something for everybody, only because and only when they are created by everybody. Public space infrastructure, urban practice, must enable, not impede or deter, peaceful exercise of and respect for the rights of, to freedom of expression, opinion and assembly. People's consultation about and participation in urban design and governance must be institutionalised in law and practice and barriers to that participation dismantled. The city should be a living place, not a silencing space. And for this, we must bring rights home. Bring rights home. Let's make that shift. Let's shift the city, shift urban housing from a place to park excess capital to a place where urban housing gives home, habitat to human dignity. With the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the right to adequate housing, and the global network of United Cities and local governments, our office is building a global movement for just that, to make that shift practically materially daily. On this 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we celebrate the city and we invite national and local authorities, civil society actors and local government officials into this global movement a global movement for human rights and for a shift, a shift to the point where cities defend rights, stand up for rights, where cities bring rights home. And I'm proud to say that we have buy-in from Seoul to Amsterdam, Barcelona to Durban, Mexico City, Montreal, Montevideo, from New York to Guangzhou, and we want to join Los Angeles to that family. You know, for example, preparing for hosting the Olympic Games in 2028, this great city has committed to 28 by 28 initiative, giving priority to critical infrastructure projects. I counted last night, there happened to be 28 operative articles in the UDHR. Come on, we could do it. We could have a complementary human rights 28 by 28, which could give and reveal, display and demonstrate the commitment of this great global city to universal freedom and dignity. 28 by 28. I'm telling you, the evidence is as clear as history is long. We will not manage this world of change without those universal values upheld. We can't lead this world of change with contempt for the foreigner, baseless distrust of those who look or love or worship differently, with intensified clampdown on freedom of the press, with encroachment on public movement, with closure of border against people fleeing persecution, by gagging of activists, or deliberately denying life-saving services essential for sexual and reproductive health. The pounding of 
those malicious fists. They may grow louder and louder on the doors of our dignity, our privacy, our mental and physical integrity, and against our freedom, but they will be and they must be resisted. We've got to stand up again. We must stand up once more for global values, for globalised time. Stand up to narratives of hate. Stand up for more equality. Stand up for more intimate security. Stand up for truth. You know, just before her death, uh, much earlier this year, the extraordinary literary disruptor, Ursula Le Guin, warned us, hard times are coming when we will be wanting the voices of those who can see alternatives to how we live now, can see through our fear-stricken society and our obsessive technologies to other ways of being, poets, visionaries, realists of a larger reality. We must be realists of a far larger, a much more generous, a much more compassionate, more justice-loving, democratic reality. And in that realism of a larger reality, the city as home has an irreplaceable, invaluable role to play. And for that purpose, and in this place and far, far beyond, we are called upon once again. And we must, and we must again and again, stand up, stand up, for human rights. We stand today at the threshold of a great event, both in the life of the United Nations and in the life of mankind. All are equal before the law and are entitled without any discrimination to equal protection of the law. Toute personne a le droit de prendre part librement à la vie culturelle de la communauté, de jouir des arts et de participer au progrès scientifique et au bienfait qui en résulte. لكل شخص حق في التعليم ويجب أن يوفر التعليم مجانا على الأقل في مرحلتيه الابتدائية والأساسية. Брак может быть заключен только при свободном и полном согласии обеих вступающих в брак сторон. Toda persona tiene deberes respecto a la comunidad, puesto que solo en ella puede desarrollar libre y plenamente su personalidad. Join us in raising awareness of basic human rights. Record yourself reading an article of the Declaration in your own language. Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including food. Stand up for human rights. Have your voice. respecterai vos droits, qui que vous soyez. Même si je suis en désaccord avec vous, je défendrai vos droits. Les droits sont bafoués pour une seule personne, cela compromet les droits de toutes et tous. Et c'est pour cette raison que je dois agir et que je vais agir. Je me mobiliserai, je me ferai entendre et j'utiliserai mes droits pour défendre les vôtres. Je respecterai vos droits, qui que vous soyez. Je défendrai vos droits, même si je suis en désaccord avec vous. Quand les droits d'une personne sont bafoués, ce sont les droits de tous qui sont compromis. C'est pourquoi je vais agir, je me ferai entendre, je me mobiliserai. Avec mes droits, je défendrai les vôtres. Voy a respetar tus derechos, quien quiera que seas, incluso si no estoy de acuerdo con vos. Cuando a cualquier persona se le niegan sus derechos humanos, se socavan los derechos de todos. Por eso los voy a defender. Voy a alzar mi voz, voy a actuar. 
Voy a usar mis derechos para defender los tuyos. En 1988, 이를 지키기 위해 강주시장인 제가 앞장서겠습니다. 제 목소리를 높이고 제가 먼저 행동하겠습니다. 당신의 권리를 지키기 위해 저의 권리를 사용하겠습니다. Barcelona es una ciudad comprometida con la humanidad. Es una ciudad que cree firmemente en un futuro comprometido con la vida, con la paz, con la democracia, con la igualdad de oportunidades, con un futuro en definitiva más feliz para todos y todas nosotras y para nuestros hijos y nuestras hijas. Por ello, en el 70 aniversario de la Declaración de los Derechos Humanos, os traslado el compromiso de nuestra ciudad y que haremos todo lo que esté en nuestras manos para hacer efectivos de forma práctica los derechos humanos de todos los individuos, hayan nacido aquí o en cualquier otro rincón del mundo. amazing to hear all of the, the city officials uh, taking the pledge. Uh, we are now going to take a deep dive into rights concerns and, and hopefully solutions for some issues that absolutely existed but were nonetheless largely invisible to those who drafted the 1948 declaration. Gender inequality, disability, the rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender populations, and immigration were all relevant, but largely unaddressed. As we think about the next 70 years and keeping the Universal Declaration and human rights more generally central to the conversation, um, we need to be able to think how to challenge ourselves, and, and particularly the students and young people that are here who are primarily the people who are going to have to take this forward to think about what are the human rights issues now that exist that we don't yet fully see, but 70 years from now will be so darn obvious. How are we going to get ahead of the curve on this one? And I'd like us all to think about the sorts of issues our panelists are going to talk about today on their own terms, but also how these issues relate to one another and the connections between them and how being aware of these connections might help us to become better equipped to deal going forward. So let me say something about our fabulous panel. Dr. Cousins, who is the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the UN Foundation, is going to introduce uh, and moderate the panel. But Dr. Cousins herself has an incredible career, and I want to name two things just to show you why she is the perfect moderator first for this panel. First, is that she was the lead U.S. negotiator for the Sustainable Development Goals, and if I can say, under a very different administration. And second, is that during her stint as ambassador, she led all U.S. diplomacy at the U.N. on human rights, on humanitarian, social, and environmental issues. So who better? And so with that, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Cousins and our fabulous panelists to the stage. Good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to you all, and thank you for being here on this very special Human Rights Day. I want to say a particular thank you to our friends at USC for hosting us today, and to USC's Institute for Inequality and Global Health. A warm thanks to Mayor Eric Garcetti and his team for their leadership, to our colleagues at the UN Human Rights Office, and of course to all of you for joining this event today. My name is Elizabeth Cousins and I'm the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the United Nations Foundation, and we are just so pleased to be here and to be honored to be with you all for this very important conversation. So today we are honoring 
marks the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This landmark document is both the unequivocal cornerstone of the modern human rights regime and an enduring call to action to human rights defenders, activists, and citizens around the world. And these are timely and urgent issues here in Los Angeles, across the United States, and around the world, whether it is about standing up for the rights of women, LGBTI people, migrants, journalists, disabled people, refugees, minorities and marginalized populations, or climate justice, which spans geographies and generations. Human rights are core to all the challenges we face today and fundamental to all of our future possibilities. We have made so much progress in 70 years, so much. And yet we are seeing every day how much every gain is vulnerable to reversal vulnerable to setbacks, and therefore how much we need to continue to do, not only to preserve the gains we've made, but to continue to advance and extend them to those whose human rights are still not fully respected. To explore more about what all of this means in all of our lives, I'm just delighted to be able to welcome this exceptional panel for a truly important conversation. Now, among all of you, you are UN champions, human rights defenders, and coalition builders of the highest order. And as individual leaders and agitators in your own work and in your lives, you show us how these incredible... Yes, you are. You're agitators. That's a good thing. You show us how incredible these principles of the Universal Declaration can be and how they can be brought to life in very real ways, as much today as in 1948. Each of you and every one of us has a home in this document. This little document right here, and I hope you picked up one on the way in, and if you didn't, pick one up on the way out. They remind us that human rights are universal, they're interrelated, and they're indivisible. And through your backgrounds and track record, and what we're about to hear more about, you all remind us how much promoting and protecting human rights is not just a job for the human rights community, but it's a job for all of us, online and offline, in media and entertainment, in the boardroom, on the sports field, and in our homes and daily lives. So let me now get to, to, to the real thing, which is our wonderful panel, uh, and I'm pleased to introduce all of you. I'll be brief because I think you know them well. Their reputations precede them, and you all have their bios on the flyer. But let me just say that this is an incredible powerhouse of a group. Uh, these are individuals who've broken barriers, blazed trails, spoken truth to power, and in their own lives and work really embody what it means to believe in a world and to try to make a world where rights and dignity of all are truly respected. So let me introduce first Alyssa Milano to my left, an activist and actress who has been a UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador for 15 years. Alyssa has lobbied Congress on a wide array of rights and social justice issues, including immigrant rights, education reform, protection of health coverage for all Americans, and of course, women's rights. Alyssa has also recently, I believe, joined the Equal Rights Amendment Coalition's Advisory Council. Uh, Candace Cable, down at the other end, is a gold medalist Paralympian uh, who makes all of us who think we're athletes feel like, no, we're nothing but. <laughs> um, she works in the U.S. and globally to promote and protect the human rights of people with disabilities. She has contributed educational material to the UN. She is an advocate for the UN's Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which, as you all probably know, was modeled on the Americans with Disabilities Act. Candace was the first woman to win medals in both the Summer and Winter uh, Paralympic Games in 1992. Uh, she has also won 84 marathons, is that right? <laughs> it's gotta be a typo, but I think it's not. Very <laughs> ambitious. Including six <laughs> Boston marathons, six Boston marathons. Uh, Rafael Agustin, um, uh, sitting in the middle, uh, is a writer on the award-winning The CW Show, Jane the Virgin. He is a 2016 Sundance Fellow uh, for his TV family comedy, um, Illegal, which is based on his own life as a formerly undocumented American. Rafael currently serves as executive director of the Latino Film Institute, where he oversees the Youth Cinema Project a statewide educational film program, and La Lif, if I have that correct, the Los Angeles Latino International Film Festival. And earlier this uh, year, LA Weekly named you one of the 50 most essential people in Los Angeles. 
I mean. <laughs> That's up there. Um, that was and, quite I, and I'm briefly going to introduce Gigi Gorgeous, who is en route and will be with us shortly. Uh, well known to you all, a trail-based blazing YouTube star, transgender activist. Tele you can in visualize, and she'll be here shortly. Um, oh, uh, in 2017, her feature-length li documentary, This Is Everything, Gigi Gorgeous, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. Uh, and last year, uh, giving Raphael a run for his money, Gigi was named one of <laughs> Time Magazine's 25 most influential people on the internet and was one of Forbes Magazine's 30 uh, under 30. And she works closely with many LGBTQ uh, organizations, including GLAAD, uh, the LA LGBT Center, and the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles Trans Youth Program. And I'll just say for my part, that I first really came to appreciate the human rights imperative deeply when I worked um, earlier in my career in a number of peace processes around the world, um, including in the Balkans and the Middle East, um, where I saw firsthand how societies can be ripped apart by violence um, when they least expect it, uh, and how fundamental the values and protections of human rights are to any recovery and long-term uh, healthy society. So before I turn to panelists, and I think we're gonna get going uh, while we await uh, Gigi's arrival as well, um, one last housekeeping note, um, not what you're normally supposed to do uh, in college, but please take out your phones, please use them, don't use them to make calls and don't use them to text your friends, um, but use them to join this conversation using the hashtag um, stand up for human rights, just the numeral four, and please turn off your ringers if you can. Um, so Alyssa, I'm gonna start with you. Um, you have been a stalwart champion uh, for gender equality, uh, <laughs> which was vital in the creation of the Declaration 70 years ago. And in fact, women from around the world worked very hard then to make sure that the Declaration didn't just speak to half the world's people, but to all of them. Among the many gains since then, we've seen a UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which has been ratified by 185 countries, if unfortunately not yet all of them. Now, given your role as a leader also within the Me Too movement, as well as um, with UNICEF as a goodwill ambassador, can you share your perspective on how we can keep the momentum going on gender equality, both in the U.S. Uh, and abroad? And what role in particular do you see for local communities, local government like the city of Los Angeles in addressing sexual violence uh, and advocating for the equal rights and dignity of women uh, around the world? First of all, thank you to, to everyone that showed up. Thank you to, uh, for the invitation to be here. Um, I, I think that this is a, a very important topic and I think it's one in which when we talk about human rights, um, if we don't fix the systemic sexism that goes on globally um, and the misogyny that goes on globally, uh, we are going to have a very hard time fixing all of human rights. Um, and I also think that once we fix that and women are truly um, uh, accepted as equal, that we will be in positions of power. And once we are in positions of power, whether that be in a company or uh, as, as our policy makers or as our global leaders, um, the rest of the problems will uh, eventually fade away. Um, as far as what we can do uh, on a, on, uh, you know, to me this is, this is a, a three-stage three um, fix, really. And what we have to do is we have to educate. I think we are uh, educating people uh, way too late on the issue of equality and acceptance in general, not just, um, you know, women's rights, but also the rights of everyone, whether that be our LGBTQ community or um, race, religion, we need to get to our kids at a, at a younger age. Um, the second thing I think is, is vital is uh, legislation. Mm -hmm. I think we have to really uh, put things in motion that will ensure um, our equality. Uh, that's why I'm fighting so hard for the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, a lot of people my age and younger do not realize that women are not part of the United States Constitution. We have one right, and that is the right to vote. It is the 19th Amendment. Um, we've been able to manipulate the 14th Amendment to also include women, but obviously the 14th Amendment was written well before the 19th Amendment. 
Um, and even Justice Scalia has said that he does not feel that the 14th Amendment covers women. So um, I, I think that it is past due that women are in the, the greatest document um, to ensure our equality and to ensure that the weight of the Constitution is backed, uh, the, the laws of the Constitution are backing women. Um, yes, please applaud for that. Um, and the, sec the second, or the third thing is, is uh, our own participation. Um, I think our own personal participation in um, really uh, committing to supporting businesses and industries that support women. I think our own personal commitment, if we're men, because there is a very important vital part that men must play in this, um, if, if, you're, you're, if you're here and you're a man and you're listening and if you take nothing away, please know that you have the power to change this and not just because you, know, you love your wife or your daughter or your sister, but because women are allowed the same inalienable rights as men. Um, and let's support businesses that support women. Let's hire more women. Let's, uh, let's mentor more women. And women that are in positions of power or that someday will get there, let's be a positive vi visualization for women in positions of power. Um, because if you, if you don't see it, you can't be it. Thank you, and I think it's, it's important not just to think about gains we've made that uh, we need to preserve, but how many barriers we actually have yet. Yes, uh, yes, to, to and break. also that we're all reaching everyone we can possibly reach. This is not just about uh, you know white women in the entertainment industry. This is about women in communities of color that are marginalized, that are low income, that are high risk. We have to do our part at, at reaching everyone. Absolutely. Um, let me turn next to Candace. Um, Candace, your leadership is such a powerful reminder that both human rights uh, and athletics are universal, crossing borders and boundaries of all kinds. Now, the rights of persons with disabilities is part of the Universal Declaration. Um, and since the Declaration's adoption, uh, a new human rights treaty has come into play, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is an incredible document, again, modeled on the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I will say one of my proudest personal moments was being personally present when the United States signed that convention. It was the first human rights treaty signed uh, by the last U.S. administration, actually. Now, about a fifth of the global population has some form of disability, which makes it even more powerful and real to people's lives around the world and in all communities. Um, uh, and a week ago, the international community again celebrated the International Day of Persons with Disabilities with a particular emphasis on empowerment and full inclusion. Now, Candace, given your experience, given your incredible leadership, in your view, um, how do you make the case and what did, how do you say to businesses, decision makers and others what they're missing if they don't fully <laughs> embrace this agenda and include persons with disabilities uh, in their daily uh, work and lives? Thank you. Um, and thank, I'm really happy to be here because oftentimes disability isn't a part of the conversation when we talk about diversity and inclusion. And it really is the D in it. And so thank you for having me and be a part of this and, and also to be a part of this panel of, of leaders because um, we all have something to offer out there. And, and I, I feel really grateful to be able to represent you know, the 59 to 60 million people in the United States that disclose they have a disability or the over 1 billion people in the world that disclose they have a disability. And I say disclose with that because in the majority of places, people don't disclose because they're afraid they're gonna be discriminated against. They're afraid that they're, um, well, there are places in Africa when someone who has albinism, they are hunted down and killed and their bones are ground up for medicine. These are people that are albinos. 
just, it's, it's really shocking to think that those kind of things still go on at this time. And, and you know, with the human rights document, um, you mentioned that disability was mentioned in it. And in the list of, of all the different statuses, the, um, the thing that was put other status when it says, you know, color, race, sex, language, religion, other opinion, national, social, origin, property, birth, other status. Only when we get to Article 25 and we talk about health and well being, disability is mentioned as a condition. And, and disability isn't a condition, it's an identity. It's an identity that people all over the world identify with, and all of you, all of us, will identify with it at one time or another. Because if we're living, we're aging. And age-related disabilities will affect us. And that's why it's so beneficial for all of us to really think about disability early on and really bring that narrative forward so that so that we're ready, we're really ready to get that out there and to live the fullest lives that we can possibly live. Um, the push with the CRPD, which is this amazing and the most comprehensive human rights document that has been written to this day, because it does include people with disabilities as an identity, um, it really is a piece that was written to help guide the world and, and create that social model rather than the medical model that we need to be fixed or cured or the charity model that we need to be taken care of um, or that we're a burden to that social place where we have a spot within society and not just a place at the table but a voice. You know, and, and that's what people are missing is that voice of disability I mean, sitting here watching all the speakers today, there's no interpreter for someone who might, you know, be deaf. Um, there was no cart service for someone also. Um, so those kind of things are super beneficial for all of us because I know with my own aging, I have some hearing loss and I love reading the cart because <laughs> I get, sometimes I can't hear what people are saying and, and I can read it. You know, so those things are important so that everyone is included in the conversation and contributing to it. Uh, I think that, um, you know, one of the things with disability, you know, and its universality is that people have a lot of fear about it. They think that it's a real loss when it happens. And it's actually just a human natural experience and a transition in our lives. And to be able to look at it like that, that it's not grief that we have to have over it. Um, we don't have to have sadness. We don't have to have fear. We don't have to have anger. We, if we have everything in place, if the world is set up to welcome anyone in any form, then there is never any loss. There is only inclusion and there's only access. And, and, and that really, I think, is what we're moving towards. And, with the mention of the Sustainable Development Goals, I'm super excited by that because when they wrote the Millennium Development Goals in the year 2000, they left people with disabilities out of that. And the Mexican contingency at the UN said, hey, you guys forgot something here. And that's where the CRPD came from. That's where that was written. And so when the Sustainable Development Goals were written this time in 2015, People with disabilities are mentioned 11 times in those goals, in the 17 goals. Yep. Yes. And so everything we heard about here on the stage is something that we are going to attain and we are going to get to. I, you know, I can't say enough about the opportunity that we all have as individuals is to get ourselves educated about disability about inclusion, get a class in understanding disability, learn about all the different disabilities, learn the language, the etiquette, the laws, the sports, the, you know, the, 
the opportunities that abound, the innovations, the technology that supports people with disabilities, really get comfortable with it. That's really going to be the future. And when we do that, and we have those experiences, we are all going to be in this together. And I think that's when we're going to see people working with disabilities. We're going to see people included in the political place. We're going to see people with disabilities in all the spaces. Thank you, Candace. Mm -hmm. Should be easy, right? <laughs> about people living their fullest lives. I think that's a really, that's a really lovely way to, to put it. Um, I'm going to give Gigi a warm welcome. Um, great to see you. Um, I think we're going to go to Raphael next to give you a chance to kind of catch up to speed with the conversation, and we'll turn to you after that. Um, so, Raphael, um, you, uh, in your work, work uh, at the heart of one of the issues that is the most searing on our national agenda and on the international agenda, and that's the question of migrants and migrant rights. Now, uh, the Universal Declaration affords everyone the right to seek and enjoy asylum uh, in other countries, and that's not the only right in question, um, but it's among the most important. Um, the UN has recently launched new global compacts on the rights of migrants and of refugees, but I don't think uh, anyone needs convincing that this is one of the toughest issues uh, and at scale that we are facing as a world community, as a national community, and locally. Uh, and, and one that we need to, to, to rally uh, to, to handle in a very different way. Now, Raphael, you wrote a TV show about your own experience as an undocumented immigrant, and I wonder if you could share with us uh, a bit about that experience, um, but also how you're seeing the present conversation uh, and what you think uh, we need to do about it. Um, a, a couple of things. I think our journalists have um, let us down when we're talking about this issue because we're talking about these human beings at the border as migrants and migrant caravans, and they are asylum seekers, and there is nothing illegal about seeking asylum, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. yep. And I recently saw an activist down there say that we are here because you were there. We are here because you were there. And that was, I thought that was the most beautiful, most elegant way of, of explaining the root cause of why this crisis is happening. We keep talking about this migrant caravan, but we haven't addressed why, they, why in fact they have traveled all this way. And I think we really have to take a close look up uh, at how neoliberalism has affected uh, the, the globe and Latin America in particular and U.S. foreign policy. Uh, I mean, when we, when we think about, I mean, my shoes are from India, my jeans are from Egypt, my shirt <laughs> is from the Dominican Republic, my phone is from China, my car is from Germany, and it, it was all assembled in Mexico. I am a consumer of the American dream, but what about these international workers? Do they not have a right to that dream that they help build? Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. I think that's a greater question I want to answer. Um, so that's, that's on what's happening at the border. As, as, as far as my work, I, I don't think my story is unlike a lot of undocumented students today. When I was in high school, uh, I was the class president, and I was the prom king, and I was an honor roll student. <laughs> I mean, underachiever. Right. Yes. Yes. I was essentially the all-American high school student. Prom King did not make it into his bio, by the way, but it was. <laughs> <laughs> I can't give you everything. Uh, and then I applied to go to college, and I discovered that I was undocumented. Uh, I got a letter back saying that you are from the universities I applied to, saying you are a perfect candidate. Can you please send us your real social security number? And I was like, Mom, what, is it? Wow. <laughs> what does this even mean? Um, and I think that's how, that's when I discovered I was undocumented. That was a long journey into becoming a writer and needing to tell my story and, and finding my own voice. And eventually, over time, I decided to write that into a script. And it was that script telling my, my parents' journey to this country, uh, my discovery, um, that got me into Sundance, eventually got me to sell it to CBS Studios and got me staff on Jane the Virgin. It's incredible how this thing that I always felt was um, my greatest burden became like this blessing in my life. I also think, if, if I, can I jump in? Yeah, of course. I also think storytelling is the m most important thing we have right now. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem with um, 
telling an immigrant story is that they're fearful to tell their stories. They're feel fearful to come out and, and say um, what the potential is if they go back home, uh, because what if they are sent back home? And I think that that's a huge problem because it's not humanizing this very human mm -hmm. issue. Um, but there's also so many things that, that we can be doing to make this more a hu more humane process. I mean, there's, there's only 700 judges, immigration judges, for 750,000 backlog cases right now in this country alone, which is, I mean, that's mind-boggling how, how nobody has come forward and said, you know what would make this sort of more humane so everyone gets a fair due process? Also- And purposely done. It's purposely, purposely done, right. People say the policy's broken. No, the policy is not broken. The policy needs uh, to be fixed in a more humane way, but the policy is doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing, which is making this a very, horrible, difficult process for people to come to this country, and that needs to change. But beyond that, I think um, there, there are so many things that we can do that are so simple to make this more humane, like, like offer uh, representation, legal representation to people. People don't realize that when they go in for their, their, their date in court, they don't have any legal representation unless they can afford it or unless, unless a pro bono company comes forward and says, I'll represent that person. So we have, you know, now with the family separation issue, we have children representing themselves, not speaking the language in a court of law. We have, we have you know, men who come straight from detention centers that are shackled and, and put in an orange jumpsuit um, uh, to, to meet their day in court. Uh, when, 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 you know, Homeland Security, uh, who's representing the government, has the best lawyers, you know, our government can put out there to fight these cases. So there's certainly things that we, are, we can be doing to make it more, a more humane process. Can I say well, something I think, I'm so yes, sorry. And I think, I, and yeah. in a second round, we're gonna go to solutions, and I wanna come back right. to some of these ideas, but yeah. The only quick thing I wanted to share, because they're not gonna believe this, is, um, Victoriana Morales came out on the cover of New York, uh, New, the, the New York Times last week as Donald Trump's undocumented maid. Yep. And I spoke to her a month ago and she was so scared to come forward. Um, she asked me what she should do and I, I told her I can't tell you what's best for your safety and security of your family, but your story is very important and relevant right now. And I talked to her last night, talked to her lawyer last night. And they said, we wish more people in Hollywood would be supporting this and promoting this. The only person who's doing it is Alyssa Milano. <laughs> I swear. And I was like, I'm going to be on a panel with her tomorrow. Okay. So awesome. no, they say thank Very you. Nice. They say thank you. But yes, wow. and more people have come forward since she told yeah. her story. So really, many, it's, many more. we have to humanize this issue. It's so important. Yeah, we also have to stipulate that you all are global public goods. So let's, <laughs> and we need you to keep doing what you're doing and telling stories and also being just um, tireless advocates for, for all of these issues. Um, Gigi, I want to welcome you again to the stage. Thank Great you. Great to see you. Sorry I was late. No, no worries. <laughs> LA traffic. We all know. <laughs> it's not the traffic. You guys had like an issue, I feel, and we started earlier. Yeah, we, we did, did start a little protesters are, are I mean, it was, uh, you know. I was actually it was on time. time. The rules I was on history, time. I was yeah. not so great. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we're delighted that you're here with us. Oh, thank um, you. Uh, and introduced you um, briefly in your absence, but you, your reputation precedes you and everyone knows well who you are. Um, and I want to ask you if you could speak a bit um, to the, an issue that remains obviously very much in the spotlight here in the United States, but around the world. Uh, which is the rights of LGBTIQ um, individuals, uh, in particular the rising threat that we're seeing to, um, uh, to and violence to trans and gender non-binary people. Um, we had the UN's watchdog on LGBTI uh, rights uh, recently um, say that this, the conditions and the vulnerability that people face around the world should offend the human conscience. In this country alone, we've had, uh, you know, We've had over 20 deaths just in 2018 alone. And fortunately, advocates like you and around the world are not taking that threat sitting down, and you work every day to give very real meaning to the first article of the Universal Declaration, <laughs> which says simply that all human beings are born free and equal mm -hmm. in dignity and rights. 
Um, so Gigi, we'd love to hear first from you about how you're standing up for, for human rights. And if you could walk us through a bit your approach to advocacy, how you see the power of online tools to reach new audiences and really bring home uh, the resonance um, uh, of, of these issues in ways that people embrace them in their daily lives and can act on them themselves. Yeah, well, I'd first like to just say this is such a moment for me to be um, here speaking. I moved here from Toronto, Canada um, four years ago. So to be here in California just <laughs> speaking with all these great people is just like, wow, pinch me. I don't feel <laughs> worthy at all. Um, but for those of you who don't know what I do, I started on YouTube um, a decade ago. And I found a community online that I could confide in. I didn't really you know, have that support system in real life. I was very confused about my sexual orientation and my identity, my gender. Um, and I came out as transgender on YouTube publicly, the most public that I've, you know, could ever imagine because of the support from online. So I feel like over the years, just sharing my story and being open online with so many people, advocacy and just being thrown into this world was kind of just, you know, my destiny. And I feel like I've always said, I'm always going to speak from my heart and I don't know everything but I do know authenticity, and I know that it speaks louder than any single thing you could ever do. And that's what I always push people to be. And I think the way that I'm combating all of the awful things that are happening within the community and in the world right now is just by telling my story, because if there's one thing I've learned from being online, it's if you say something out loud and put it out there, if you affect one person's <laughs> life, that's priceless, you know? You never know who you're gonna touch, especially with social media and YouTube. And that's the beauty of it. But at the same time, there is kind of that dark side as well. But you just need to be, you need to be ready for it. And I feel like I've been doing it for so long now. I will stand tall. I will scream <laughs> my identity and what I'm feeling from the top of the Empire State Building, bitch. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, we are live and we're public, and it's totally fine. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I think I'm done after that. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, um, since we're already, we're <laughs> freedom of expression. Always. Um, yeah, and speaking truth when you need to. This is all the time, um, and authenticity, as you said. Um, so let's turn to some solutions um, uh, and just to very practical ways that you've seen work in, uh, your, in the areas in which you work, but also things that people in the audience um, and here uh, at USC and uh, around the city can actually embrace in their daily lives um, as actions that they can, they can take. So I do want to turn to solutions and ask you each essentially the same question, um, which is, how can we in our daily lives, whether we're employees, employers, we're consumers, we're citizens, we're activists, we're, we're, uh, we're in media, et cetera, how do we make the UDHR a living document? You know, this was created 70 years ago. Eleanor Roosevelt had one of the pens. I mean, it's this time-honored document that has had to be updated uh, and expanded in all the ways that, among others, Candace, you spoke so forcefully to, uh, and we've broken important ground and we have so much more ground uh, to cover uh, as well as to protect gains as we've talked about. But if we think about where we want to be, uh, let's say five years from now, if we come back on the 75th anniversary of the UDHR, what do we want to have seen changed? What can we do about that? What practical steps can we take to really make this a living document and a tool that we can use for, for making important change? Um, in the world. Um, I'm tempted, Gigi, to start with you, if I yeah. can. Yeah, why don't we go of course. to you first, yeah. Um, you know, I was actually at a GLAAD event last night, and if you guys don't know GLAAD, they are like the best ever. Um, and aligning with Sarah Kate Ellis, the, um, you know, head honcho at GLAAD, has been one of the most amazing things I've ever done because she is so smart and she just, educates the world on issues and she's so up to date and she's always traveling and fighting for our community and I feel like my goal at the end of every single day and five years time is just equality and I feel like for the most part the rights that have been taken away from us the hatred we we receive on a daily basis 
the violence that's coming towards our community is all out of just fear and ignorance. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, you need to educate these people that don't see it because we are all born human. We are all born with, you know, the, hu the human rights we should, we should live with, but they're being taken away from us because people think that we're, you know, mentally ill and weird or scared of us, whatever. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I just feel like it's education. I think people really need to be educated, and I've, I've seen so many stories where Sarah Kate Ellis personally has turned someone's mind around, and I think that's a beautiful thing. And I think GLAD is, is they are the watchdog for the community, and I feel like everyone should, should be watching them. Great, and that's an issue that Alyssa also raised mm -hmm. earlier about the need to start early and often in educating people about their own rights and about the rights of others so that people really, from the time they're quite young really internalize how, how absolutely fundamental these protections and rights um, mm -hmm. really are. Um, Alyssa, let me actually turn to you, sort of, do you think the kind of practical steps, you've outlined a number of them already, but kind of, do you think the kind of charge you would give to people in this room, the charge to all of us, what are some practical solutions that we can focus on in the near term that can secure well, I think the broad umbrella is that we just have to take care of each other. And what, what came to mind uh, when you asked this question initially was um, a quote uh, from a, a wonderful doctor, Dr. Parker. I don't know if you know of his work, but he's actually providing abortions in the deep south. Um, and he, he works through multiple states, um, you know, to, in, in very rough conditions. And I saw him speak the other day, and what he said is, it's not enough to be non-racist. You've got to be anti-racist. Mm -hmm. And I think when you really think about that um, and what that means, it's not enough for us to be accepting um, and, and uh, to, to open our hearts and minds, but we also have to be against those that aren't. Mm -hmm. And be vocal about that. It's okay to say, you know what, nope, you're not gonna talk like that in front of me. Or, oh, locker room talk, you think that that's totally acceptable? Men, no, that's not acceptable in front of me. Um, so to really, to really live by that, that taking care of each other and what that means. And I think that this goes beyond just um, uh, you know, a state, local level, but also global. As a UNICEF ambassador, I've traveled the world and seen firsthand the, the uh, horrible conditions that people and, and children live in uh, throughout the world. Um, you know, I, Yemen is, is, is heavily on my mind right now. Um, and how in this day and age, we can still be living in a world where children are dying every 10 minutes from starvation. When I remember being young and that happening in Ethiopia, and thinking to myself, well, they're gonna fix this problem and then no kid is ever gonna starve again. And here we are. Um, how, how did we get to that point where we're not taking care of each other? Also, it's all connected. The intersectionality is so important mm -hmm. because human, humankind, all of, the, all of the issues that we face, all of the human suffering is connected to every issue, whether it be the environment or women's rights or immigration. These are all things that are connected, and and we're not we're not any different than than the people. Um, surely we are much more privileged, but we all have the same hopes and dreams, um, and really just want to live our happily ever after. So what can you do to make that happen? Um, but on a local level, uh, you know, I think we we need more adequate standards of living. I think we need to take care of our environment and whatever that means for your household, it's very important. Um, I think uh, we need more public services and, and what that means for everyone, uh, you know, maybe to volunteer in those public services, know that you can make a difference. Uh, prison reform, prison reform. And we need to fix the police brutality issue throughout our country um, and make more humane instances for people. And they are all interconnected at the most fundamental level because it's how we treat each other. It is. And it's, it's just about how we respect each other and it's how, I mean, Candace, to your words, how you enable everybody to live a fully lived life. But also what happened to like, mm -hmm. when I grew up, my parents used to say to me, put yourself in their shoes. 
And to me, that is something that doesn't really exist anymore, this idea of empathy, especially in this country where we've become so um, calcified in our political ideologies. That, that, that idea of put yourself in their shoes, put yourself in Candace's shoes, when I, and, and thank you for this, because it's a great reminder, but when I read anything now, whether it be that declaration or our constitution, I will think of it also as the mindset of the disabled. Because I think even, even when we're talking about everyone has the right to vote, well, we need to make sure the disabled people can get to the voting booth. <laughs> Indeed. So, and we talk about voter suppression all the time, but we don't talk about the fact that a lot of disabled people can't get to their polls because mm -hmm. there's no access for wheelchairs. So thank you. Thank you. But listening, put yourself in other mm -hmm. people's shoes. Empathy. Should be our first instinct, right? I think it is. <laughs> I think it often is too. I think it yeah, is I because I see that. it in my kids before it's beaten out of them by, by society, <laughs> you know? I think, I think innately it's part of who we are and, and somehow we become very, um, there's, a, there's a tribal as aspect to the way in which we live where w how we live is right and how other people live is wrong. Um, and I think that that, that has uh, really contributed to a lot of the, uh, the very distinct uh, uh, upset that we're facing in this country right now. Well, and, every, and in many places. And in many places, but yes. Well, Candace, let me, let me maybe turn to you about, yeah. about that. Solutions, they can be high, low, local, <laughs> ambitious, small. All over the place. All over the place, because <laughs> it all counts. Well, you know, just counts. along the lines of the empathy, I, I wish I had way more skills in technology than I do because I absolutely love it, but it takes me so long to figure out. I, have, I need a bunch of really young people to follow me around or something to help me with certain things, but virtual reality is absolutely amazing. And I really look forward to the day of that type of technology mm -hmm. helping us build empathy because it has the ability to do it. I took part in a, a virtuality piece that had to do with Antarctica, and it was about 15 minutes long, and I had the glasses on, and I'm sitting there. And for about half of the time, the 15 minutes, I was immersed in snow. And I took the glasses off, and I was cold. I was really cold. Mm. Like, I physically felt mm. it. Mm. And, and I think that's a technology that we can expand on to really be able to create that, that empathetic feel. But beyond that, spend time with people who aren't like you. Yes. Really bust yourself out there. You know, I mean, when you were speaking about um, the, the ally piece, uh, it's so critical for us to um, learn about other people with other people. Because it's one thing um, I, teach understanding disability education, and, and I work as a consultant with different groups, and so I, I teach the vastness of disability and how it really is all of us. We're all a part of it, and it's, it's something that we all have to take on because, because it's a part of all our lives, and, and when I teach it, one of the things I begin with is to talk about our own bias and our own stigma that we believe. Because um, when I was first injured in um, 1975 at the age of 21, I had a spinal cord injury, I'd never really seen anyone with a disability before. And before that, I lived a pretty awesome life as a kid in Southern California, running around, doing whatever I wanted, being whatever I wanted, always believing I could do anything I could possibly want to do. I'd never even seen anyone with a disability. And I had this life of optimism and opportunity. But when I had that spinal cord injury, I instantly thought that my life was over. Mm. And I thought, where did that come from? Like, how, like, did I just like absorb that by osmosis? Hmm. And I did, I absorbed it from society, from messages that I got from society. And so I think that doing some activity to question your own bias and do it without shame or embarrassment or fear, or putting yourself down, just 
be aware of it. Like when you hear that voice, like, oh, why is that person in there, blah, blah, blah. And you go, oh, why did I say that? Why did I think that? Just question it. I think once we become aware of our own biases, that we then can step into another place of being connected to other people, become that ally, learn the empathy, and then begin to move forward to create this place where everyone's welcome. That was very powerful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. <laughs> Raphael, this means you're next. <laughs> I, I don't think there's anything better than educate, legislate, and participate. I think that's very, very powerful. Uh, I was thinking that Ernest Hemingway once said that the shortest story ever told was told in six words, and that's um, baby shoes for sale, never worn. And that's a very powerful story, but I think an even more powerful story can be told in five words, and that's that we are in this together. Mm -hmm. It's not me versus you, us versus them. It's we are in this together. Um, I, I really uh, greatly appreciate this panel that, that highlights that when it comes to LGBTQ rights and women rights and disabled rights and civil rights and immigrant rights, it's all one and the same because it's all human rights. And I think once we, we start accepting, accepting that, we'll be in a better place. And maybe the answer is not to build bigger walls, but to build longer tables. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, we would all be in a better place if we were able to live by all of the kinds of examples that you live by and the kind of courage and leadership that you all show. I think what's really striking to me in listening to all of you and in thinking on about coming here um, for this event is how, um, how very basic these values come down to being in our own lives, in our families' lives. And I mean, Alyssa, as you said, I think you see it in your own children where they, you know, pe people start out wanting some very basic things in their lives and actually having some pretty good instincts. And um, part of our job, whether it's as parents or it's community leaders or it's government officials or anybody else is to try to model and show ways and enable people to kind of live up to their highest aspirations and their best values. Uh, and, and find ways to combat maybe some of the other demons of our nature in, in, in different ways. Um, we started early, and so I think we're kind of coming close to the conclusion of our, of our panel, but I want to give you one more chance uh, maybe to say some final thoughts before I do a little bit of concluding, and maybe we'll go in reverse order this time, if that's okay. Sure. Um, Alyssa, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share? Um, I really like quotes, can you tell? Um, <laughs> so, uh, Cory Corey Booker has said, don't let your inability to do everything prevent you from doing something. And I think that's really true w when we're talking about human rights, because I think we can look at it and the scope of it and think, wow, this is so insurmountable. How do I, how can I help? I, I, can't, I can't do everything to make this better but that should not prevent you from doing what you can do and from doing something. Uh, all, I, all I would say is um, I would ask everyone in this room to, to not use the word illegal anymore. Yes. <laughs> Words are very powerful. Yeah. Um, the reason... Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the reason words like illegal exist is so we can criminalize a group of people. Being in this country without documentation is a civil offense, not a criminal offense. And it's very important to make that distinction because when you criminalize somebody, you take away the First Amendment right to free speech and the First Amendment right to assemble. And the Pew Hispanic Research Center has discovered that deportation happens most frequently during two times. One, when immigrants try to unionize, and two, right before payday. So immigration to me is a labor issue, mm. and I please ask that we stop using these very hateful, specific words that take power away from human beings. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Candace. Boy, words are so powerful. They are. Um, I, you know, I would say um, it's okay not to know, and um, it's okay never to have thought about it. Uh, oftentimes, when I talk about access and inclusion, uh, people go, oh, I never thought about it like that. And uh, I said, well, you don't have to. 
right? If you're walking around in the world, you're not going to have to worry about if there's steps or not or a ramp. But once you know, you do better, hopefully. And so it's OK not to know. Um, but once you know, try to do better. And, uh, and don't beat yourself up for things that you don't know. Because we're all learning, and we're all trying, and we're all working to do the best we can. So be kind. Be kind to yourself. Be kind to other people. And, um, and just really put yourself out of, you know, I, I said it once before, but put yourself out of your comfort zone. Go somewhere you haven't been. Talk to people you've not talked to before. Um, ask the questions. And also be willing to make the mistakes. Because um, I've been taking some courses in learning how to be an ally uh, for disabled people of color uh, because I began to understand my own white privilege. And I believe that that was so wrong to have any privilege like that, that um, I, when I do speak up, I say, if I step in it, <laughs> please help me. Please forgive me. Um, I want to do better. So um, that's the thing that I would leave with people. I, I just like to say thank you to you guys, honestly. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Alyssa. We thank go way you. back. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, but Raphael and Candace, I mean, I, I feel like I've been so enlightened today, and I've kind of taken on your passions as well. And I think what you said, especially about, you know, hanging around people that you wouldn't normally hang around is so powerful because I think that's like, like today, I mean, I would not be here if I wasn't willing to take a chance and, you know, step out of my comfort zone. And I feel like I've taken on so much within the, what, 30 minutes, 45 minutes we've been sitting here. It's like actually crazy. So I just like to um, hear, hear everything that they just oh. said. I'm going to be cheesy. And back at you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here, here can be the, the, the word of the day. Um, well, I just want to say a few, a few takeaways for me from this conversation. I think first, just to remind us of something that Kate Gilmore said earlier. There is a reason that this Universal Declaration is the most translated document in the world. I mean, think about that. It's really quite extraordinary. And I think it's because it deep down reflects the highest and most fundamental aspirations that all people have for the lives that they and their children and their communities deserve. Um, second, I think it's important to keep in mind both how far we have to go, but also how far we've come. And, and that's a really important balance to keep in our minds, even as we struggle uh, in some very challenging ways. Um, third, that we need solutions and that there are solutions. It's very easy to get um, captured by feelings of the, the, the struggle and, and, and all of the challenges we face. But, you know, 70 years ago when they were negotiating the Universal De Declaration, they thought they were going to fail. Mm -hmm. They were at a breaking point and almost nobody thought that they would adopt that declaration without a single negative vote. And yet they did. Uh, and I think we've heard today how the kind of solutions we need to find need to cover the gamut uh, from education to participation to legislation. They need to deal with systemic issues as well as issues of basic values and day-to-day -day behavior. Um, but there are solutions. Um, fourth, I think human rights and, and advocating and pressing for all of these advances that we need to make is a job genuinely for all of us. And upholding the standards of that declaration, working to realizing, realizing them is a shared responsibility. It's something that every single person in this room and in your communities can take on board. And it isn't just about standing up, paying attention. It is about not being a bystander. It's about more than just not doing harm. It's about actively doing good. And I think we've heard and seen today all kinds of ways that we can do that. And finally, just this message of empathy and solidarity and mutual support. Um, we really do need to support each other. Human rights, the issues that they cover and that they express are inextricably connected to one another. Uh, they're mutually reinforcing and they apply everywhere and at all times. So we will not solve, let's just take climate change, uh, if we don't consider the rights of women or the rights of migrants. We will not protect the human rights of migrants if we abandon LGBTI individuals. We will not be able to uh, protect the rights of children if we don't think about, about uh, disabilities. And we really cannot fully enjoy any single one of our human rights 
unless we protect them everywhere and for all people. Um, and this point about spending time with people with whom we disagree and where there are differences and that we don't understand is so fundamental and something that I think all of us can take home and really act on in very small and large ways uh, uh, from the minute we leave this room. Um, so I just want with that to thank all of you for being here. Yes? And thank you. And I think what we have heard was actually a very spirited, uh, if dramatic, beginning to our session uh, this morning. Where no, and th thank you. I, I, I. Thank you, thank you very much, and we, and we have had a very robust debate and exchange over the course of this morning. Um, I think we actually have just had our concluding statement, so I think we can take that on board as we, as we think about leaving the room uh, and going, going into uh, uh, the, next, the next parts of our afternoon. And I just want to thank 
no, we're, we're actually not, I think, taking, taking comments from the audience, so I want to um, you know, acknowledge um, the comment from the floor, but I think we are going to conclude. I, because we're, <laughs> sir, uh, we are actually not meant to be taking co comments from the floor, but I will, since you are sitting in the front, but then we will, very briefly, very briefly. That is a wonderful you. note on which thank to you. conclude. Can I ask you all to join me in giving a warm applause and thank you to our panelists. Thank you so much. And I'm now going to invite Fafia Gruskin back uh, to the stage as the panelists leaves. Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm sorry, please, 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 please. Um, please, can I ask you to take your seats? Um, it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Provost Michael Quick to offer some closing remarks. And Provost Quick holds the Nemorowski Provost Chair and also serves as Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs for the University and he's the university's second highest ranking administrator. But the reason that I am so pleased he will be our final speaker is his commitment to having the university tackle quote unquote wicked problems. These complex issues that are by nature resistant to easy solutions. And frankly, the issues we've been dealing with all morning are nothing if not wicked. And working in tandem with communities, with activists, with the United Nations, with governments, these wicked problems require research, programmatic work, and the sort of education and training that is at the heart of what a university does. And with that, Provost Quick, the floor is yours. Oh, my goodness. Thanks for applauding a provost. That's very kind. Um, <laughs> Uh, even though you have no idea what one is. Um, a big shout out to Sophia Gruskin and our Institute for uh, on Inequalities in Global Health and the uh, Office of the Los Angeles Mayor, uh, the Office of the United Nations High Commission, uh, all for sponsoring this. Uh, thank you so much for our panelists. Um, I sat up there and, and listened uh, to the, the panel. A uh, really great uh, discussion of a number of important issues. Uh, around this, but mostly thank you all. Thank you all for being here and participating in this. More importantly, thank you for your commitment uh, to Universal Declaration on Human Rights, because it is going to take a village. Um, I, I reflected a lot on uh, the comments that were made uh, in the audience, that were made in the panel, uh, some of the comments earlier uh, in, in, with the speakers. Um, you know, it's great to celebrate the 70th anniversary uh, but it's also, as was pointed out in the panel, a living document that we must recommit to every day. Um, we're far from accomplishing any one of the 30 items of the Declaration. So we must remain vigilant, we must struggle, we must seek uh, justice at every turn. There will always be dark days, no doubt about it. Um, but I'm optimistic that the next 70 years uh, will continue, uh, will continue to see um, progression, uh, progress in this, in this area. I'm optimistic because of technology. I'm optimistic uh, that uh, information is being democratized, that information continues to be freer every day, um, and we need to know the facts so that we know how to deal with issues related to um, human rights. 
I'm optimistic because of social media and the role that it plays and the role that narrative plays and that individual stories play in making a difference in human rights. I'm optimistic, as Sophia mentioned, about the role that universities play in this struggle. We can lead this effort. Here at USC, we've been launching initiatives aimed directly at issues of social justice and human rights. We are tackling issues in our own city, like homelessness, immigrant integration, global education, global health inequalities, to name just a few. Research and education, sure, that is what universities do. But also, working in larger networks outside of our own bubble to affect change. We partner with the city, we partner with the county, we partner with other governmental organizations, we partner with NGOs and community-based organizations, we partner with other universities to put boots on the ground. I tell people all the time, USC, we're, 70, 000, we're a 70,000 person army and we're going uh, to battle for social justice. As was mentioned in the panel, universities have a role in inclusivity because the more we look like the world, the more we understand what it's like to be somebody else, the greater impact we can have. And so one of the places that I think universities can have a huge impact is in making sure that we are diverse and inclusive uh, on our campuses. And so we're doing that work. But mostly I'm optimistic about the current generation of young people. I visited a local high school just two blocks away from here uh, on Friday. And all over the walls of that high school were images of inclusivity and diversity and in human rights. Um, and those students were talking about it and, and, and thinking about it. It was part of their curriculum, but it was also part of their extracurricular activities. And it was just wonderful to see. What I love about this generation is it's a group that's willing to say when things don't make sense. Why do we do the things we do? But more than that, it's not just pointing out where we're having problems. This generation points to solutions that will change the world. Willing to create and lead solutions, not just follow. We're teaching uh, a number of our faculty, a couple of our faculty uh, uh, this year are teaching an amazing class. What they did was they, it's a, it's a class of I think around 12, 15 students and, and these students and those faculty flew to the refugee camps in Greece uh, in September I believe it was. And they've now come back obviously and they've been working on entrepreneurial solutions to challenges that they saw in those refugee camps low-cost, high-impact solutions that can be put into um, practice in the refugee camps. And so they're working on those all this year, and then in the spring, they'll fly back to those refugee camps and start implementing their solutions. That's the kind of thing a university can do. That's the kind of thing that young people are doing all over the world. You know, the 19th century clergyman, Theodore Parker, filtered through Martin Luther King, Jr., you know the quote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. But that isn't, that is only true because people like you are grabbing that arc and making it bend the right direction. On the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, no better time than now to do bending. Thank you all for coming. Fight on. Thank you, Provost Quick, and thank you, everyone. It's, it's been amazing, and I, we are so grateful to all the speakers and the panelists who gave us so much to think about and so much inspiration. 
Um, on behalf of the Institute on Inequalities in Global Health, I would like to take a moment to thank our partners in putting this together, USC as a whole, the United Nations Foundation, the Mayor's Office, and the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And I want to thank all of you for your fabulous energy and engagement throughout this panel. But the last thing I want to say is please, let's not stop here. Please get involved and stay involved. Now, one quick thing you can do is to take a selfie. And after we leave here, go to the website and record your voice taking the pledge. Share it with your channels. It's a small thing. It's symbolic. It doesn't take that much. But it connects us who are here in Los Angeles with all that's happening in the rest of the world. So let's continue the conversation. Let's commit to uphold our actions in terms of what in our own actions it means for the UDHR and what it represents for us here in Los Angeles and to people around the world today and over the next decades. Thank you all and happy December 10th.